Chers toutes et tous, euh, c'est avec euh, grand plaisir euh, que euh, je vous présente euh, le professeur euh, Christophe euh, Heil de l'Université de Duisburg euh, Essen, euh, qui va présenter une conférence dans le cadre du séminaire Intersection de euh, l'unité de recherche Climat 4196. Uh, now I'm switching to uh, English to uh, present uh, Christoph more thoroughly. Christoph Heil is uh, Chair of British Literature and Culture at the University of Duisburg Essen. Earlier stages of his education and career include Frankfurt, Goethe Universität, London, with the German uh, Historical Institute and University College London, Berlin, Humboldt Universität, and Bamba, Otto Friedrich Universität. His research focuses on the interplay between literature and cultural history, including architecture, the visual arts, and music, especially with the 17th and 18th century. Christoph Heil is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in London and the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in Edinburgh. He's worked on topics such as the rise of the private sphere in 18th century London, and related phenomena in literature, uh, collections and collectors in 17th century England and the literature they inspired, 18th century paintings and engravings, crime and crime fiction, Scottish literature and identity, Scottish music in the 18th century, early cultural encounters between Britain and India. He's currently working on an English edition of his one volume history of English literature published in 2020 at Kleine Englische Literatur und Geschichte, a history which brings together literary and cultural history. He lost his job, uh, so he told me in his email, at least, and he's looking forward to sharing some of his research uh, with us. Um, and uh, today, uh, he'll be speaking with us, to us about I quote, the dark stranger, the earliest encounter with coffee in 17th century England. Thank you very much. Right. Can you hear me? Okay, dear students, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear colleagues who are going to be friends, um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak here. It is an opportunity to strengthen the link between Bordeaux and Essen. It is my privilege, together with Rémi and Christophe Cognard, to run a series of French-German, German-French conferences on the 18th century. Last spring we did the conference in Essen, and now next week uh, Rémi and Christophe are doing the conference here. Um, today, you are giving me a chance to introduce myself and my work. I am a professor of English literature and as you've heard, my most important field of research is the 17th and the 18th century. Now, in Germany, if you work in our discipline, there is one fairly common question people get asked and that is, do you do literature or do you do culture? Now, I must confess that I've never understood this question because I do not accept the underlying distinction. I firmly believe that literature doesn't materialise out of thin air. It emerges from a whole world of other texts, but also ideas, mentalities, cultural practices. I therefore believe that to work on literature without considering its cultural context would needlessly impoverish our work and vice versa. I do not think it would make much sense at all just to look at culture without looking at literature because literature is after all one of the most fascinating manifestations of culture. This is why when I work on texts I like to bring them together with cultural contexts. My academic background is both in literary studies and in history. Um, and I'm, as I've said, I, I'm particularly interested in cultural history, in material culture, in the visual arts, and also in music. Uh, I have an interest in objects and cultural practices attached to them because I believe that all of this speaks about the past. For my talk today, 
I've chosen a topic from the 17th century which allows me to bring together the study of texts and cultural contexts. My topic comes out of my research, which goes hand in hand with my teaching. And last semester, I, uh, I taught a course on the cultural and literary history of hot drinks in England. Now, we spend a lot of time studying texts, studying all sorts of source materials, but we also did some practical experiments preparing various hot drinks using original recipes. So we made, for instance, 17th century style hot chocolate, chucking in handfuls of marzipan, rose water, spices, and other weird and wonderful things. Um, and also we, we used ingredients such as achiote and musk, uh, so we very definitely took a bit of a walk on the wild side. You can never know what these ingredients will do to the human body <laughs> until you try. Uh, and we tried. Uh, now, don't worry, uh, because I'm not going to expose you to any such practical experiments today. Today, I'm going to talk about coffee in England, or to be more precise, about the earliest encounters with coffee in 17th century England. And this is where you might think, how? He, he's going to talk about England and coffee. Can't be quite right, because isn't, isn't England the, the country of tea drinkers? And indeed, from the 18th century on, tea has been playing a hugely important role in English culture. It became much more than a hot drink. It became an iconic element of everyday culture, and it became almost a magic drink. Whenever something goes drastically wrong, if you've broken your leg or something worse has happened, there is a deep-seated, very English belief that what you need immediately is a nice cup of tea. And that nice cup of tea will somehow make things better. If you have to go to war, uh, what you need is a nice cup of tea. If the German Air Force attacks London, what you need, very obviously, is a nice cup of tea. So, why are we going to talk about coffee in England, not about tea in England? Well, because if we go back to the 17th century, we see that there was a time when tea wasn't drunk at all in England, but coffee was already a big thing. Now, how did this happen? How did coffee become available in England in the first place. From the late 16th century on, more and more English merchants traded with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was a source of a multitude of oriental luxury goods, such as spices from India, silk all the way from China, Persian and Turkish carpets, and delicacies such as olives and dried figs. Huge profits could be made by getting such goods to England. For this reason, some English merchants went to the Orient. Um, they went, for instance, to Istanbul in order to establish a permanent base there. And this allowed them to cut out a whole string of middlemen to buy goods locally for good prices, which could then be sent to England. And while living in the Ottoman Empire, some of these English merchants embraced Ottoman culture and the Ottoman way of life. Now, this image here is a bit later, uh, 18th rather than 17th century, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what was going on. This is, by the way, Mr. Levitt, one of the English merchants in Istanbul, together with a daughter of a French consul in the Crimea. Now, already in the 17th century, People like this man went to places such as Istanbul. They began to dress like local people. Um, they began to eat like local people. And of course, they began to drink like local people. And this means they would have discovered Turkish coffee houses. Here we have a later image once again. But we know from written sources that their 17th century equivalents would have been very, very similar. People living in the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire for any length of time found these places very interesting indeed. There were 
in some respects like ale houses, like pubs, but weird pubs without any alcoholic drinks. Instead, the men gathered there to have a strange black bitter drink, something that didn't make you drunk at all. In fact, something that made people wide awake. Like alcohol, it was a stimulant, but unlike alcohol, it was not incapacitating. So English merchants and others who embraced the Ottoman way of life acquired the habit of drinking coffee. They got so much used to it that once they went home again, they brought this habit with them. So one way or another, this led to the establishment of coffee houses in England around about the middle of the 17th century. There was probably a very first coffee house in Oxford in 1650. I say probably because there's a bit of a debate about this. Oxford as the location makes a lot of sense. Uh, a foreign student from Crete is known to have prepared and drunk coffee here as early as the 1630s. Uh, Oxford had a professor of Arabic from 1633. Uh, the first incumbent, a man called Edward Pocock, had lived in Aleppo and Istanbul himself. And we know he was interested in coffee because he translated an Arabic text on coffee. Um, so this is rather interesting uh, little text, just, just four pages uh, given in Arabic and English. And uh, by the way, have a look at the, at the last line. Uh, if you take your coffee with milk, please take note. Pocock says, some take it with milk, but it is an error. And such as may bring you in danger of leprosy. You have been warned. Um, now, this bilingual edition was more than just a curiosity. Professors discuss their work with their students, and students are, of course, likely to try out new drinks and drugs and such like. So Pocock must have helped to spread the, the habit of coffee drinking. So once again, it is not so surprising that probably we had the first English coffee house in Oxford the first coffee house in London was opened in 1652. This we know without any shadow of doubt. Um, and the story begins with a man called Daniel Edwards, who was an English merchant who lived in the Ottoman Empire in Smyrna. Um, and he returned home, and he brought home his Greek servant, a man called Pasqua Rose. Uh, and part of his job was to make coffee for his master every morning. Now imagine. Edwards lived in the heart of the city of London, in a little alley called St. Michael's Alley. And this is still part of a warren of tiny alleys. When I do study tours to London with my students, I usually take them there because you can get an idea of what pre-modern London felt like. Now, in the 1650s, this area was very densely populated. It was also very busy because the Royal Exchange, as you can see on this bit of map, was just around the corner. Now, imagine someone made coffee there for the very first time. Now, that means hundreds of people would have smelled that coffee for the first time ever. Now, their reaction to the smell of coffee would have been very much unlike our reaction because it was a totally unfamiliar, alien, new smell. It was suspicious. Remember that at the time it was believed that you could catch horrible diseases like the plague through bad smells. Um, so that smell would have been a bit scary. So what, what do you do as the lone coffee drinker in your neighborhood with uh, all the neighbors sort of giving you that suspicious look? Um, well, you, of course, you explain what coffee is, you invite them in, you give them their first cup of coffee, and before you know it, they will return. And that happened to this, this merchant. So he had sort of lots and lots of friends and neighbours knocking on his door every morning saying, could we get another cup of that stuff you call coffee, right? Uh, and that 
totally, totally, totally disrupted his life. He couldn't get his job done anymore, so he had to get rid of him. Um, so his strategy was to allow his Greek servant to set up a coffee stall outside the house, uh, in the churchyard opposite the house. And uh, the coffee stall became instantly very, very popular. And that led to the servant, Pasqua Rosé, opening the first coffee house nearby. Now, the, the actual building doesn't exist anymore. Um, today, there's a, a 19th century pub on the exact site. However, there's a plaque uh, commemorating London's first coffee house. Um, 1652, that is fairly early. Uh, the, the earliest evidence for co coffee being served in Paris is in the 1670s. The famous Café Procop was founded in 1686, if I remember correctly. Um, the first coffee house in Vienna was also founded in the 1680s. So England was at the forefront of coffee drinking. Pascal Rosé's coffee house was extremely successful. It's successful. His business model was soon copied by others. Uh, so more and more new coffee houses opened throughout the city of London and also in Westminster. Uh, we do not have any precise figures for these early days, but we do know that 50 years later on, in 1700, there were about 600 coffee houses all over London. 600, that's a lot. Um, it is safe to assume that the number of coffee houses particularly went up after the Glorious Revolution of 1660, because that was when London, after the revolutionary period, returned to having a monarchy, and that was when they left their, their enforced Puritan behavior behind. So hedonism was no more frowned upon, and now it was perfectly fine. Indeed, it was encouraged to spend money on luxuries such as coffee houses. Uh, coffee. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what coffee houses of the late 17th century looked like um, because we've got this, this visual source here. Uh, now, if you look at this, first thing you know is there are just men in there, apart from one woman preparing drinks. Uh, English coffee houses of a period were very much homosocial spaces that were not accessible to women. Um, if we have a closer look, we see long tables, we see benches, we see not just uh, coffee, but we see lots of printed papers on, on these tables. Uh, first, in the 17th century, this would have been all sorts of material, poems, ballads, uh, during the interregnum, during the revolutionary period, uh, of course, lots and lots of political pamphlets. Uh, from the 1690s, with the development of English journalism, coffee houses also made newspapers available. Um, so, coffee houses were about coffee, sure, but even more so, they were about reading and discussing texts. Coffee houses were spaces governed by specific rules. So, to get in, you had to pay an entry fee. So, you paid a penny on the door, and that got you into the coffee house, nice and warm, you could sit down, didn't get any coffee for that penny, but that uh, allowed you to read all the papers. Uh, and then you paid another penny for your coffee. Um, so, uh, one important thing was also that, yeah, special rules applied, so you sat down wherever you found the first free space. Um, usually people would have sat around a table uh, according to a social hierarchy, and here that, that social hierarchy is suspended. Um, we've got lots and lots of written sources about coffee houses. Some of you may be familiar with the absolutely, absolutely wonderful diary of Samuel Pepys. Um, this is one of our key sources for London in the 1660s. Um, and there are many, many instances where Pepys uh, talks about coffee houses. Uh, like, like here, they're, they're going to the coffee house 
and I sat with Sir George Askew and Sir William Petty, who, and who in discourse is, methinks, one of the rash, most rational men that I ever heard speak with a tongue. And then he, he, there's a long paragraph uh, where he talks about what they talked about, what the conversation was all about. And all his entries on coffee houses in the diary are like this. So he never says, he never comments on the quality of a coffee, a uh, splendid coffee, no. He talks about who was there, what were they talking about. Um, so this is really what, what coffee houses were all about. He went to the coffee house to read, to have conversations, to debate the news, um, to uh, status hierarchies were suspended. So what counts here is not the hierarchy of birth. It's not the hierarchy of money. It is the hierarchy of strong arguments in a debate. So coffee houses have therefore been characterized as important sites of the early enlightenment, notably by Jürgen Habermas. And I must say that by and large, I agree with his analysis because it is totally consistent with a vast range of sources. When in 1695 censorship came mostly to an end in England, this would have had an influence on coffee house discussions. From the glorious revolution onwards, 1688, the concept of having a legitimate political opposition gained ground. And this is really a big thing. This was really a game changer because the concept of having a legitimate opposition meant that criticizing the king, criticizing the government, was not treason, but rather a necessary element in a system of checks and balances. Because people understood that today's opposition could be tomorrow's government. Therefore, someone disagreeing with the present government, even disagreeing with the king, was no more thought of as an enemy who needed to be eliminated, physically eliminated, as in killed. No, that person was a political op opponent with whom you needed to have a discussion. And this was, I suppose, a way of digesting the horrible experiences of the English Civil War. So the concept of having a legitimate opposition means that the sharp word replaced the sharp weapon, but the debate replaced the duel. Coffee houses became intimately associated with journalism, which rapidly developed after the demise of censorship for most texts. This was where papers were read, but also this was to a large extent where the early papers were written. So editorial teams of the new newspapers, they met and worked in the coffee houses. They, they used them as an ad hoc office. And by the way, coffee houses were used as lots of things. Um, it became very common, for instance, to have one's letters delivered, not to your home address, but to your favorite coffee house, which again means uh, that this was something men could do, but women could not, because they didn't have access to, to coffee houses. So, in a nutshell, this is the development of coffee houses in 17th century London. Now, of course, whenever something really new comes up, there will be people who are opposed to it. And it is therefore not surprising that there was instantly a debate about coffee and a debate about coffee houses. And I'm now going to give you a sense of how that debate emerged, how it was conducted. And to do that, I'm going to look at two texts, one for and one against coffee. And I've chosen these two because they are characteristic of the entire debate, because they contain the key arguments used by both sides in this debate. This is our first text, fits on one sheet of paper. Um, the title is A Broadside Against Coffee. Now this is 
fairly clear, a broadside that is an attack directed against coffee. A broadside is when, when all the cannons on one side of the ship go off with a big bang. And at the same time, it's a, it's a pun on the title because broadside, that is also the name of the sort of print product we are looking at here. Something that has been printed on just one page. Okay, so now we've got our head around what a broadside against coffee means. But what about the second part of the title? Or the marriage of the Turk? What on earth is this supposed to mean? Of course, coffee was a Turkish drink, so there must be a link here. But at this stage, when we begin to read the text, we have no clue at all what this part of the title might be all about. But that serves a purpose. It is enigmatic, so it makes us want to find out. It makes us want to read on. So it draws us into the text. And this is how our text begins. Coffee, a kind of Turkish renegade, has laid a match with Christian water maid. So, a story is being told. Coffee is personified. He is a Turk. And what is more, he is a renegade. So he is someone who is not loyal to his religion, not loyal to his country. Why? Because he has left his country to marry Christian water. We are beginning to understand that the whole story unfolding in this poem may be a humorous but also a hostile take on the whole process of making coffee. And that starts by bringing coffee together, by marrying it to water. And the whole things, thing happens in England. So the water is English, the water is Christian. Coffee, so brown as Barry does appear, too swarthy for a nymph, so fair, so clear. The voice we encounter in this text maintains that Turkish coffee and Christian water are not really an appropriate match. She is so fair, so clear, he is definitely too dark. But we can see where this is going, can't we? The 17th century saw an early phase of globalizations, contact, globalization, Contacts with the wider world outside Europe became more numerous, more intense. And this time, uh, at this time, we can observe the formation of basic topoi of racism. And this is how our story continues. Coffee, the foreign dark guy, sails from Turkey to England. On his arrival, he disguises his appearance being transformed from berries into powder, into ground coffee. Pause but, but a while, and he is none of he. So he transforms himself, which for truth and not a story tells, no faith is to be kept with infidels. See, absolutely typ typical, isn't it? You can't trust these unchristian foreigners. And this is immediately followed by a rather interesting literary, uh, literary illusion um, that is meant to demonstrate just how dangerous such dark-skinned men are. Sure, he suspects and shuns her as a whore and loves and kills like the Venetian Moor. Yes, the Venetian Moor, that is Shakespeare's Othello. And exactly like that story ended in tears, the story of the, the, the marriage between the Turkish coffee and English water will not have a happy ending. So using the, the simple literary technique of the simile, like the Venetian Moor, that associates coffee with death. It is best to get rid of such insolent foreigners. Bolded Asian brat, with speed our confines flee, water through, though common is too good for thee. So coffee, just like Shakespeare's Othello, 
is driven by strong urges. In the next couple of lines, the pernicious marriage of the Turk progresses. Coffee and water are having sex, but not in a way he would have envisaged. Sure, coffee is vexed. He has his breeches lost, for she's above, and he lies undermost. He's not amused because she is right on top. Um, this introduces an element of humour, or rather, of ridicule. However, it also continues to maintain the conceit underpinning the entire poem, the analogy of the marriage of the Turk and the process of preparing coffee, because that's exactly what happens when you, when you prepare coffee. If you pour boiling water over the ground coffee, the coffee will sink down and the water will indeed be on top. Now, coffee has now been associated with intrusiveness, with death, with sex. First, then the first man who made coffee in London is ridiculed because of his accent, along with his assurances that coffee is good for you. A coachman was the first here coffee made, and ever since, the rest drive on the trade. Me no good English. And sure enough, he played the quack to sell his Stygian stuff. Very boon for the stomach, the cough, the pissy. And I believe him, for it looks like physic. So we've got the, the, the strong accent of the foreigner who says it's, it's good for you. Um, the whole attack against coffee culminates in the following couplet, in which coffee is directly being addressed. From bawdy houses differ thus your hap. They give you their tails, you give their tongues a clap. So visiting a coffee house is visiting like visiting a bawdy house, a brothel, and it carries the same risk. So this is where the body part chiefly concerned will take an infection, the clap. And in the coffee house, you get the clap on your tongue. Thus, the, the sinister association of coffee and sex and death is presented as the bottom line of the entire argument. Now, all of this is pretty drastic. It is a potent mix of xenophobia, racism, and dark fears. The sheer violence of this attack might be a bit surprising at first glance, but after all, such attacks must have been driven by vested interests. It is not just the novelty and the perceived un-Englishness of coffee. With the appearance and the rapid proliferation of coffee houses, the whole economy of selling drinks in London changed to start in a big way and in an unprecedented way. Imagine you were one of the hundreds of people in London owning an alehouse, a pub, selling beer, selling other alcoholic drinks. That was your livelihood. Uh, and suddenly all of these coffee houses pop up. You would not have been best pleased by this new competition, which Oliver, uh, which, which um, uh, after all, enticed customers away from what you had to offer. Imagine you were a brewer, or imagine you were someone who imported fine wines, say, from Bordeaux. Um, all of this helps to understand why people would have seen fit to damage the reputation of coffee. Now, let's have another look at the other side of the controversy over coffee. Here we've got a pro-coffee text. Um, once again, this is a broadside, something printed on just one sheet of paper. It was, it says in the last lines, uh, printed a bit later than the broadside against coffee in 1674, so also in the early 1670s. It was printed for a man called Paul, Paul Greenwood, who ran a shop selling coffee. It is possible that these broadsheets were given away as, as free promotional gifts to customers. Um, you can see a peculiar damage pattern in, in the middle of this, this sheet. Um, and this 
suggests that this, this sheet may have even been used as an early product wrapper. So you went and, and bought your coffee beans and they would have been wrapped into, into this thing. So this is really quite a remarkable survival. Um, we are looking at a fairly fancy broadside. It comes with not just one, but two titles. And in the middle, there is a woodcut illustration. So this was meant to be more attractive, to look more sophisticated than the anti-coffee broadside I have already discussed. Now, let's have a look at the, the first section of, of this uh, broadsheet. The first title is a brief description of the excellent virtues of that sober and wholesome drink called coffee. Now, this was printed in the 1670s. Coffee had been around for 20 years, but those who sold it still saw the need to explain what it was and what it did in the first place. Uh, the reason for this was probably that they were looking to expand their market beyond the very privileged, the very educated. They wanted more new coffee drinkers, so they had to explain what coffee was all about. Uh, the title maintains that coffee actually does good things. It has excellent virtues. Right from the beginning, it is associated with sobriety and health, sober and wholesome. And this is a first step towards building up an argument against alcoholic drinks. Second title goes even further on the right hand side. Its incomparable effects in preventing or curing diseases incident, incident to humane bodies. So this says coffee is not only harmless, it is good for you. It is medication. It is has both preventive and curative powers. The woodcut uh, consists of three segments. In the lower half, we see the earliest surviving image of an English coffee house, so this is important. Uh, the upper half shows two plants. On the left-hand side, a coffee tree. On the right, a vine. And this is programmatic for the entire text, which will present not just an argument for coffee, but at the same time, an argument against wine. Now imagine you're trying to come up with an argument against wine in England in the 1670s. That was not exactly the easiest thing to do, because first of all, of course, wine was very, very firmly established in religious culture. It was, after all, the sacred drink of Christianity, no sacred, no Lord's Supper without wine. In a secular context, the status of wine was also very secure. When in 1660, England went back to having a monarchy, and when the years of Puritanism were over, hedonism became legitimate and fashionable again. So occasional or even permanent alcoholic excess became compatible with being a gentleman. The conspicuous consumption of fine wines was also accepted as a status mark. And also, emulating the behavior of the king was a way of demonstrating your loyalty. And the king very definitely liked wine. So you showed your loyalty by drinking wine. The cultural dominance of wine, both sacred and secular, was such that it was not at all easy to assail its status. However, this is precisely what the text does. It begins with a startling, all-out, full frontal attack. When the sweet poison of the treacherous grape had acted on the world a general rape, drowning our very reason and our souls in such deep seas of large overflowing bowls. What's happening here? Wine is being described as sweet poison. And what is more, and even worse, it is treacherous. So straight away, we're deep in the territory of both medical and political discourse. Like the anti-coffee text we looked at earlier, 
the drink under attack is personified. So wine does things. It behaves in a downright evil, destructive way. It acted on the world, a general rape. So very much like the text arguing against coffee, wine is associated with dangerous sex, and in this case, with sexualized violence. Wine as a rapist, wine as an evil force of nature, drowning reason and soul. And he goes on like this, and drink, rebellion, and religion too, made men so mad that you know what to do. This next step in the argument might look a bit enigmatic, but for people in the 17th century, the meaning of these lines would have been absolutely crystal clear. The country had just gone through a traumatic civil war and then through an equally traumatic phase of revolutionary government. Both became to be called the Great Rebellion after 1660. And one thing that was characteristic for these chaotic times was the very firm connection between conflicting political and religious ideas. Our text suggests a, prov a provocative explanation why the English Civil War started in the first place. The reason was an unholy trinity of drink, rebellion and religion. So what we have here is an argument based on early Enlightenment thought. Wine is bad because it switches off rational thought. The great political disaster of the 17th century could have been prevented if people had kept their fingers off the bottle. After this, coffee is praised as an ideal alternative to wine. In this text, it's not a toxic substance associated with faithless foreigners, but the very opposite. God, co coffee is God's gift to mankind. It is a panacea healing everything. And what is more, it is a pleasant thing, making people merry while they remain sober. Then heaven, in pity to effect our cure, first sent us this all-healing berry that wants to make us sober and merry. We have seen how the broadside against coffee instrumentalized xenophobia. Coffee is not from around here, it's not English. It comes from the Orient and therefore it can only be dangerous. Now, this text here develops a counter argument to this. It praises coffee's region of origin. Arabian coffee, a rich cordial, to person person beneficial, which of so many virtues does partake, the country is called Felix for its sake. Coffee is a rich cordial, a pleasant medicinal sub substance. It's cheaper than wine. It doesn't do any damage. It comes from Arabia, but this is not held against. Arabia, as we shall see, is a good place. And coffee is the best thing about Arabia, which the text maintains is therefore called Arabia Felix, Happy Arabia. And that phrase, of course, goes back to classical antiquity. Uh, when there was no such thing as coffee drinking, so educated readers would have noticed the little bit of hyperbole, the little joke here. And this is how the text continues. From the rich chambers of the rising sun, where art and all good fashions first begun, where earth with choicest drowsy is blessed, coffee appears. So the Orient is associ associated with wealth, culture, luxury, and all manner of good things, precious things. It is, in fact, something like an enormous cabinet of curiosities full of the choicest rarities. And coffee is the most wonderful rarity. So here the old idea of ex-Oriental looks is used. And after that, the medicinal properties of coffee are praised. So there's a long list in the text. Forgetfulness, melancholy, gout, coughs, Loss of appetite, consumption, hypochondria, no matter what, coffee will cure it. If you've got syphilis, no matter. Avoid the usual therapy, and mind you, the usual therapy was to swallow liquid mercury, 
drink the coffee instead. It will do the job. Uh, while wine is described as a source of impotence, coffee is said to be an aphrodisiac. By it, the men, rather a more active mate, to stronger drink and, uh, and base adulterate wine enfeebles vigour and makes ladies pine. Nor have the ladies reason to complain, as fumbling doolittles are apt to feign. Coffee's no foe to their obliging trade, but by it the men rather are more active made. To stronger drink and base adulterate wine enfeebles vigours and makes nature pine. Loaded with which the impotent sot is led like a soused hogshead to a missus bed. But this rare settled brain prevents those harms, conquers old sherry and British claret charms, whilst trusty coffee is my anteater. So the text creates drastic images in our imagination the impotent drunkard versus the vigorous, clear headed coffee drinker. Now, comparing our two texts, we've seen that. The second one takes up the argument presented in the first one, challenging and subverting each point that has been made. In a broadside against coffee, we find a deployment of xenophobia and early racist stereotypes. In a brief description of coffee, the Orient is celebrated as the, Orient, the origin of all culture, good style and luxury. While the first text associates coffee with sex and death, the second one associates wine with exactly the same. There is in any case a strong connection being made between coffee and sex, which, depending on the perspective of the text, is cast as either deeply sinister or very much desirable. In A Broadside Against Coffee, we have found a perception of the Orient which is pretty much in line with Edward Said's famous analysis of what he called Orientalism. So the West created an, an idea of the Orient, an idea which was associated with inferiority, violence, a tendency to behave in an over-sexualized way. The second text, however, is based on a totally different perception of the Orient. Here, the Orient Everything Oriental is admired as vastly superior to everything the West has to offer. This discourse is combined with early Enlightenment ideas, such as an emphasis on sobriety and rational thought. It is also associated, I suppose, with the sort of libertine thought that was part of early, the early Enlightenment. The two poems I've discussed are certainly not the greatest literature ever written. However, I find texts such as these rather interesting because they are so rich in associations and connotations, connecting them to a whole range of discourses. So you start out because you want to know about the debate of coffee, and you think that is going to be your primary focus. But suddenly, you're looking at ideas about the Orient, you're looking at the formation of racist ideas, we see the reception of older literature, for, uh, for instance Shakespeare's Othello, and we could have looked at old medical and more recent proto-scientific ideas of the, of the 1600s in these texts, uh, such as the deployment of the, the theory of the four humours. We could also have looked uh, in much greater detail at the political discourses submerged in these texts. Uh, the coffee lover's voice in the second text, embracing both the luxury of the exotic text and the erotic hedonism associated with it, is very clearly a royalist voice. And by the same token, those seeing coffee as something unchristian were likely to have Puritan sympathies. So there's really no end to the ramifications of ideas you can chase up in these texts. And this is, I suppose, one of the joys of what we do for a living. It's like sort of looking at a bowl of spaghetti. And if you try to pull out just one of them, you will find there's another one clinging to it, and another one, and another one. So you've been interested in, in one thing to begin with, but you can't help picking up more and more. And in the end, 
you are ending up having a rather satisfying meal. And this is why, why we like what we do, I suppose. Thank you.